showing up to go on a ride is the biggest challenge you will ever face is to make that first step. So don't be afraid and don't hold back saying, I just need one more piece of gear. I just need one more thing and then I'll go do it. No, just go do it. You will make do without that piece of gear and you will have fun. And you know, misadventures are still adventures. You will just have a better story to tell. <laughs> Hi there all, I'm Rob and a lot of people know me as my nickname is Salty Beard, as you can imagine. Um, thanks a lot for inviting me and uh, and it's great to be here on, on your podcast. Um, I have a background in photojournalism and I've spent most of my life working in the bush and, uh, and either working or playing. Uh, and cycling has always been a part of my life. So as a youngster, I would go and be adventurous and go into the backwoods on a 10 speed and just bring a sandwich with me and go down all these little logging roads uh, where I lived. And that was kind of essentially my, my kind of childhood. But then as mountain biking got going, getting into a little bit of cross country racing, I still liked the back country adventures. So I was kind of in, into bike packing before bike packing was called bike packing. It was just a backpack and a mountain bike and go off to a remote lake and camp overnight and and kind of enjoy yourself that way. Um, bike packing, I think, has evolved a lot since it's kind of taken a direction uh, that we're in right now. It's uh, essentially, in a nutshell, it's uh, different from regular road touring with panniers. The uh, Kind of the advances in bag construction and bag design allows you to have a very maneuverable bike to be able to go off road, which is essentially what bike packing is. But it's obviously kind of broadened from there with certain races and, and events that go on that are more pavement oriented. So, you know, if you want to call it touring or fast touring or fast packing, um it's all about having fun while you're out and uh being as self-sufficient as you can so that's essentially what bike packing is yeah it's funny i i found out about bike packing through making this channel and i didn't really know it was a thing i just i i assumed it was i know people backpack i know people uh they do like trail hikes and everything and then i found out this was a, a whole thing and as you kind of said you were doing this before it was a you know, termed bike packing thing. It, it seems like it's kind of blown up since I found out about it. Um, like you look at, there's like websites and everything for this and maybe 10, 20 years ago, the idea didn't even exist. And with like the, the development of the internet and these communities and stuff, everybody's kind of latching on to this idea of bike packing and getting out there and seeing the world. Uh, is that kind of how you're seeing it or how did it kind of come into lens or popularity for you? I, I think it's very true. The internet and the accessibility of information has definitely ballooned a lot of sports. I mean, you know, just insert whatever in, in a blank line. And, and that's obviously going to be in, uh, influenced by the internet and the availability of information. I mean, we take a look in the 70s when there was a big resurgence in um in bike touring as being a more affordable way to go out and 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 recreate and see places with minimal expenditure and and back then a lot of the touring and the cycling type of people they were very frugal they were very into you know making their own things and do getting by with what they had and um as you know people with money come into it well then they need the 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 you know, the most expensive, the best of whatever. Um, as you very well know, with internet and with how society is, a lot of it does revolve around the cool gear you have. And that should never be either a barrier or a reason to be doing anything of, of something like this. The information that's out there now with just where to ride is just so much easier than what it used to be in the, even in the 80s getting that information, it was all up to you to figure out where you wanted to ride, uh, where the risks were, where, you know, you could get food, where you could camp, all of that was your doing. And this network now that's available has definitely opened the eyes of many riders of like, oh, I don't need to go on the highway 
and battle traffic. I can go on these little logging roads and down these, you know, beaten paths and have an adventure. And then it's just a matter of how scary do, do I want to make my adventure? Do I want to make it, uh, you know, hard or do I want to make it uh, long? There's different scopes of this. I mean, and the term bike packing, I mean, I don't really know the the origins of it. I mean, obviously, bikepacking.com is a is a great instigator. Um, there's many other websites that are themed that way, and it's it's definitely ballooning. As for the term bike packing uh, versus road touring or touring in that sense, I think may have just been the aspect of bag design and having more off road. Um, off-road ability of your cycling with gear. That was always a problem back in the 80s is the only way to really go off-roading was to have a backpack because there was no bags that that were made for that. Some people were had frame bags back then. You'd make them yourself, but you still had to have some panniers or something. And while there was companies that were making very rugged racks and uh, rugged bags, you're still dealing with a very wide bike. And so going through single track trails that were rough was almost impossible. You'd, you know, it'd either be hard to ride your bike, hard to get through those trails and hard on your gear. So kind of like the, the changes in bike packing bags or the bags that we know now as being more streamlined i think is definitely the they needed a new term for that versus you know touring off-road touring is so that that name came about from there um but i think the the community aspect is what is really big with bike packing and uh, the sharing of routes that everyone can go do the information that's there uh, online of where you camp and and um, you know where you can get food, that type of thing, is really advantageous for people to make it accessible. That they have that information to go do it, and they can make a conscious choice of what routes they want to go do and try, and and you know either be in their comfort zone or push their comfort zone. I love that so much. And I have a before we dive into like the the meat and potatoes of this conversation, I have a story for you. So this this past weekend, I. I did my first, eh, kind of like second, I did a 50 mile bike ride and Excellent. I showed up to this thing. Uh, I had just finished doing a marathon. So I knew that the stamina was there. A lot of my training was, was on a, a bike, either out in the woods or on a stationary bike at home. But I showed up to this thing and I was immediately intimidating. People are like riding around this, this parking lot, you know, riding around this field, getting warmed up. They have their bike helmet, they got their bike jersey on, they got all this gear, they got their GPS, and I'm showing up just in like a t-shirt and pants. I think I had, I had the like the bike shorts, um, but I have a skate helmet, some bike shorts. I don't have a GPS. I got like an old mountain bike, and uh, you know that that, that kind of tied in really with what you said. Like a lot of people sh are kind of intimidated by this stuff because it's so expensive to get involved and get started, um, and even even after the event started, some guy came up to me in this fat tire with all this gear, and he's like, "Is this your first race?" I was like, "Sure enough, how can you tell?" And he's like, "Well, I could just take one look at you and tell." Um, and I ended up I ended up beating him. That that's like not a bragging right or anything. I was I was in like the bottom five to ten percent of all the finishers. Uh, but yeah, if you if you you know try to talk yourself out of everything because of all the unknowns and whatever even for an organized event like i could have very easily said i don't have enough stuff to do this but it was so much fun and and that's one of the reasons i started this channel so i can learn about all these new different things that exist in the world and kind of expand my mind uh mm -hmm. talk to people that are doing cool stuff and then kind of motivate myself to do it as well i think that's like with any sport whether it be cycling or skiing or whatever right you show up as a neophyte with whatever gear you can afford at the time and you're comparing yourself to these people that have been doing it for five or ten years right so they've got all the the cool bits and bobs and they've got some of that experience but i think like true to form i mean you'll meet people that have their own little nose up in the air but the majority of in the cycling aspect is everyone's been there 
And there's still a lot of people that carry that mantra about it doesn't matter what you have, right? So there still is high-end racers who show up with pretty battered, you know, put together, hobbled together gear and are racing on an old bike and they still get out there and give her. And that just, mm -hmm. I think, really shows that, that um, you know, off-road touring and bike packing is very accessible. A lot of people that I talk to that, that are wanting to get into it are all about like, oh, well, I need this bag and I need that bag. And I, it's like, no, you don't. You need to throw your tent on the front of your handlebars with a bungee cord and you need to take a backpack and throw your sleeping bag in the bottom of it because it's going to be the biggest thing. Throw a little bit of food in the top and ride to your closest campground out of town and make an overnight of it and pick some different trails or places that you haven't ridden to get there. And that's it. That's essentially how you can start. And you don't need lots of fancy stuff. You know, if you've got a tent or something that's a shelter, depending on where you live, for some people it's warm enough that it's just a tarp over top in case it rains and they sleep on the ground and that's it. Um, so it's really, it's very accessible. As long as your bike is in reasonably good condition and you can get there and back and ride within your, you know, your comfort zone for distance, that's how easy it is to enter bike packing if you want to look at it that way. Yes, it's nice to have good gear and light gear and small gear, but there's a time for that. You don't need to have everything super light, super small and compact. And even my own gear, I'm starting to expand on that. I'm starting to enjoy bringing a frying pan with me again, rather than a one hot cook, right? So, I mean, it's uh, it's all tailorable and scalable. And that's the thing. That's what I like about it. Is it's, it's purely scalable from being, you know, your beginning ride to big, huge, you know, monthly or yearly expeditions where it takes you a year and a half to go ride something, right? I guess to that to that lens, the guy was so nice. Every time I I find one of these communities of events or whatever, everyone's so so nice. He came up to me, you know, is this your first time? Yup. Hey, do you have snacks? Do you have water? Do you have like? Uh, he was giving me tips and tricks as much as I would listen to. Uh, and I think I rode with him for an hour before taking off. Um, I know I know you have like a major background in doing a lot of outdoor stuff. Uh, like how did how did that kind of drive? you getting into this or or kind of wanting to teach people and make bike packing among other things approachable um i mean as as uh i've kind of mentioned before in in some other interviews that i've done is is how and why i started my youtube channel itself was purely as a way to document my own trips so that my kids could see them um aside from the the slew of pictures that i would bring home um, but as I started doing that, one of my good friends and that kind of kind of said, hey, you're like the cool uncle that, that everyone wants to have who's who, uh, you know, can give them answers of how to do things, not just cycling, but, you know, overall outdoorsy stuff. And uh, and I kind of looked at it that way. And it's like I do. I have a lot of information stored in my head that I happy to give people and, you know, take it with a grain of salt kind of thing. But uh I love passing that knowledge on and seeing people either overcome one of their own fears or an obstacle or allow them to grow as a cyclist and, and as a outdoor recreationalist and uh, do it in a, in a safe manner. And, and also I love exploring the back country and I've lived all over Canada and many different places. And if I've not worked there, I've, I've, always gone to explore places. Um, my wife and I do move around a lot because we like to move to somewhere new and have an intimate knowledge of that area. And we do a lot of exploring when we're there. So I have a lot of back road knowledge of Western Canada and, and other parts of Canada and even in the US. And with that, people will ask me of certain areas and I can lend them you know, re reasonably good information on certain areas. And I like to pass that on to people of cool places to go see because a lot of people just don't explore their backyard enough. And that's what I like about passing that knowledge on and in part to enabling and allowing people to get into sports um, and overcome some of the barriers that they have or the phobias and, and kind of, you know, 
dull on that sharp edge of getting into something. I feel that a lot. There's there's a lot of people in Michigan, which is where I'm from, that don't like this state. And I think Michigan is very underrated. We don't have the mountains or anything, but if you drive, you know, a little bit north, we have lakes, we have woods, we have gorgeous everything. Mm -hmm. And the people that kind of hate this state, it's because they never explore it. Um, I mean, we camp a lot. We've done some truck camping, hikes, you know, all that, all that type of stuff. And yeah, once you do it a few times, you kind of become a resource for people and you can, as you said, break down those phobias and fears and yeah, you know, be a resource for people to kind of dive into that stuff. Um, and I think you and I are both similar in that regard where it's, it's fun. It's part of the enjoyment to teach people and kind of get them out of their comfort zone. Um, which is, which is where I want to go with this conversation. I know that you've done a handful of things and you have this race that will, will not this race, this, uh, course that you put together uh that we can summarize it all with but can you tell us about how you've kind of broken down these barriers in your community to make make things easier for people to get into biking um well partly in my channel and my youtube channel is just the way that i kind of i guess show show what i'm riding is that you know I'm an older guy. I have injuries. I could be a lot faster. I could be a lot lighter, but I'm still out there doing it. And I think that's part of what I like to show people is that it doesn't matter about your body size or shape or abilities, uh, whether it be cycling or, or whatever, right? It's taking up the challenge to challenge yourself and to get out and do things and again it's all scalable so it's you know it's not about big miles it's not about riding you know hard stuff it's about getting out and having fun and that's where i think you know that that's what i'm trying to show to people and then um those barriers breaking over those barriers a lot of that is just through um, my communications within my own network of just talking with people um, some of you may know that I'm a co-founder of the uh, Van Island Bike Pack Collective, which that idea was offering kind of a venue or a collection for people to come out and try. And it's an all-inclusive, all low-barrier type of um, group, uh, about five to six times a year. We have rides. They're all relatively short. Um, you know, so the most of the time you're going for a ride, it's only 60 or 80 kilometers one way to a camping spot. We have a collective uh, of gear so that all the people that are in the group have always, we keep a track of if somebody says, you know, I have an extra bag here or there, we put it into a, into a, a call it a rental pool or a loan pool of that sort. So if somebody comes to us and say, I'd love to go, but, you know, I'm short a sleeping bag we can reach out to our own little group and say, hey, does somebody have an extra sleeping bag they can borrow? So that's how we make the the entry barrier really low is just give access to certain things. Um, we've also got sponsors that are involved that give us free product that we basically raffle off every single trip that we'll give away four to $600 over the stuff every trip, whether it be coffee or a set of, you know, tires or, you know, Sometimes it'll be a rack or a bag or something, but it uh, it really draws people in. And and in working with that group, that's something that I really try to do with my own is to allow people to talk about their fears and phobias and kind of open up with how to deal with those and how to reduce those barriers for them and, and move forward and challenge themselves. Bikepacking can be daunting to you know the neophyte that's just starting in as you were talking about your race right there's a lot of unknowns for for people and i think for a lot of people they're more so city dwellers in in that respect from urban environments and they want to go out and enjoy the outdoors and that's can be a, a scary moment for you to go off in the middle of nowhere and and sleep and hear things that go bump in the night um and it's a it's a big challenge for people and just talking about that and helping people through those those barriers yeah i mean i went on mine and i have a, a patch kit for my tire but if i blew a tire i, I wouldn't have known how to change it i just <laughs> i've never done it on a bike before like you, you give me a truck and whatever i can do that but 
I've never done it on a bike. I need to educate myself, but I knew I was also in safe hands around, you know, hundreds of other bikers that could stop by and help me out. Uh, so it was like a, I eliminated that risk just to get out there and try the rest of it. Yeah. Um, and it's funny that you mentioned that because that is one of the top most thing that, that people always say is what is my, what if my bike breaks? You know, that's their biggest fear is actually fixing their bike. It's, it's the, I think if something's to go wrong, that's the first thing that's going to go wrong is that something will break on your bike or you'll crash and hurt yourself. Those are the top two things that people always think about. Right. So, and there's ways to mitigate that, but, uh, that's that's definitely a, an aspect of riding bike packing in a group and i think bike packing in general and i think cyclists in general i mean i don't know uh every time that i see somebody broken down with a bicycle as i'm riding by i always stop to make sure have they got the tools have they got the knowledge to fix what they're fixing and you know i'm happy to be late at whatever i'm doing so that i can help somebody else fix their bike if i've got anything that i can lend you know even if it's just my knowledge happy to help yeah and it kind of makes me laugh because a lot of people are driving around with with their cars right now and they either don't know how to change a tire or <laughs> or a lot of companies started removing spare tires from their vehicle so if you don't know if you have a spare tire you should probably check um yeah but they don't let them stop them stop them from driving to work every day it's just it's kind of interesting yeah. um yeah, so that's super cool that that you you guys are doing that. And one thing I'm finding as I interview a lot of these these different guests is there, there's kind of this with the new wave of the internet. Obviously, you can go and find any information you want, but there's all these weird tours and like guides and groups popping up around the world. Uh, one of these girls I interviewed, she does um, like hiking tours, and that's something I never would have even really thought about. Uh, but yeah, if you're like trying to get in hiking overnight, same deal. You can sign up with this with this company and go and hike with a bunch of moms for a weekend. And uh, you know, you're you're doing this stuff in your community to try to introduce people to the sport. There's running clubs around you. There's there's just like all these communities that are in your local area or near your local area that you can kind of tap into to get involved, along with the wealth of knowledge that exists on the on the internet and hopefully you know, in podcasts like this, um, yeah. I guess, how, how have you seen that kind of expand from your little collective that you're doing into other areas? Um, I think in the cycling, the cycling world in, in that regard, there was a really big push in the seventies of, of getting back into cycling, uh, like in, in that era. And at that time without the internet, there was a lot of cycle touring companies that popped up. So that was really uh, common back then to find these tour companies that would cart your gear around for you. They would have a bike, you just showed up and they'd give you a bike and you'd all collectively go and go on a ride that the itinerary was already laid out. You didn't have to bring your bags. They would be meeting you at, you know, at your destination of the day. And so that's kind of, I mean, it's always been there, but with the internet, it's uh, more prevalent. It's easier to, to have a company or a service like that. And there's just more people doing it. And there's more information on where to go. So it's easier for those people that are organizing rides to come up with new adventures for people um so i think that's always been there it's just that it's a lot more visible with the internet and there's just more uh you know companies if you want to call them companies because that's essentially what a lot of them are they're at some way you know making a buck to do this and um and you know not that there's anything wrong with that um but that's what i see with the internet just that you know everything is scaling up so we're seeing that more prevalent but we're seeing that in all aspects of sports like moto tours um you know adventure adventure riding type stuff the um the there's a lot of other companies that are doing route designs 
that are here's a guidebook for you to go ride it by yourself but by the way we also have scheduled rides and you can come with one of our guides right that will help you and then you've got that extra mechanic as a backup right so you know your bike breaks down or something you've got a you know somebody who's quite knowledgeable that's there and can help you out and and for a lot of people and let's apply that to something else it's the same like guided fishing adventures right same type of thing it's it's uh it's ballooning because people want to get out and do stuff but they like the security blanket of doing it with somebody who knows what they're doing and sometimes that's how a lot of these people get into whatever adventure sport they're doing is they go out on a guided package first and go oh you know i can actually do this and then they go off and they do it themselves and make their own adventures so i think that's good having these guided tours if you want to call them that these supported tours um and there's there's a lot of them all over the place there's some big huge events that are like supported events that are the same type of thing you you show up you ride or race and all of your logistics is handled I don't know why I never drew, drew the parallel of of like doing a guided hunt or a, a guided a chartered fishing trip, but that makes a lot of sense because yeah, I've done a couple of charters and I'm not a big fisherman. I I go out and hunt on my own, but I'm not a big fisherman, mm -hmm. and so that was like perfect for me to just get a, a taste of it and have my hand held through the whole thing. Uh, yeah, it's it's like going with a you know a, a, a local who knows. The ins and outs of something right uh whether it be fishing or cycling or 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 even just the logistics of you know where to ride or or what to see um and again it's that knowledge backup that oh i've broken a spoke on my bicycle but i mean that's a pretty major deal to most people but if you've done it enough it's like that's repairable in the field so having that that person with you definitely makes you more comfortable and they have lots of knowledge to give so just going on one kind of guided you know tour and or being in a collective where you've got people that are more experienced than you and even if you go on a on a bike packing race or a, or a or a bike packing event that's not a race but you're with like-minded people that have uh, more experience than you you'll just naturally you know absorb and and have that appetite for information and you'll learn a lot and people are happy to share their experiences and their knowledge with you and i think that's part of course in a lot of a lot of outdoor recreation um they're they're happy to impart that knowledge and and get you on your way to a, a safer more enjoyable recreational pastime right yeah one thing we talked about in our pre-call that i i really like the idea of is you mentioned that you know, type two fun, you know, what we're trying to capture in this channel is kind of like a sliding scale. I mean, I'm talking to people that are doing, you know, cross the United States biking events or ultra marathon runners. And I know personally, I can't do that today, but I'm trying to push myself, learn about these things, get inspired to, to do more things like this bike race I mentioned. And for me, you know, that was my level of type two fun with that sport. Whereas some of these like ultra endurance people they would just think that's like a casual saturday um can you kind of talk about that level of scale and how how you work with that with all the like extreme events you've done um yeah i mean you take a look at the the ultimate definition of type two fun is something that sucks while you're doing it and hurts and you don't want to be there but once you've finished it it's it's amazing that you've accomplished that and it feels good after i mean that's the definition of type two fun so the sliding scale is you know how much can you ride in a day what is comfortable for you or or your within your scope going beyond that is type two fun you're sore because you're riding farther than you've ever ridden before now that may not be very far in comparison to somebody who's an you know an elite athlete in that genre of riding but it can also encapsulate a lot of other things and it's something that i see as we previously mentioned a lot of people the first thing that scares them is what if my bike breaks down well there's other things 
um, generally bikepacking racing and bikepacking adventures if we if we get into the the racing aspect it's a solo event that's how it's supposed to be tackled obviously the larger and more popular of the event the more chances that you're going to bump into people that you're riding with so they won't be that far away but essentially it's about challenging yourself and being 100 self-sufficient and that you can't borrow gear from anybody else you can only use commercially available things like restaurants and hotels and bike shops you can't stop at a friend's house and get something so you have to be self-sufficient and there are going to be times when you're going to be alone in the wilderness and those are phobias that a lot of people have that bump in the night issue right um so all of those i chalk up as being type two related challenges there are things that will put you outside of your comfort zone that will either be scary or you know physically hurt you in the sense that you know you've big climbs or long days in the saddle those are all part of type two fun and then there's weather i mean a lot of people don't factor in the weather you can have a beautiful route that that's an amazing ride when it's sunny out but as soon as it's pouring rain and sleet and you know and and the temperature drops well that's no fun that's type two fun right um and it's funny uh this actually came up in conversation at, at a few events that i had dealt with recently and people were talking about um the rain on Vancouver Island, especially the north end of Vancouver Island, uh, the, the weather is really fickle up there. And it can be 30 degrees and sunny one day and it can be five or eight degrees and raining the next. And someone asked me, it's like, how do you ride through that stuff? And I kind of equated it to, uh, I do a lot of bike commuting to and from work in whatever weather, it doesn't matter. Um, I've done a lot of commuting in Alberta in the middle of the winter. And I always look at it as being, um, if you're riding in crappy weather, look at it as being, you're the only one out here riding in crappy weather. That doesn't make you silly or stupid. That makes you a badass. That you're out there challenging the weather and you're the only one out there doing it. So that's like a feather in your cap. You should feel a little bit, you know, omnipotent. That you're like, I'm just awesome and i think that's something i always tell somebody is when the weather gets crappy think about all the people that are sitting at home going like you know whining about oh, it's crappy outside and you're out there challenging the elements and getting through it and that just makes you more powerful and and in my books and like an awesome person so you know be badass and don't worry about riding in the rain just you know give her yeah it's uncomfortable at the time you might be wet but eventually you'll dry out <laughs> You'll dry out and you get to brag about that down the road. That's that's right, you know. So I think I think the type two fun in bikepacking is definitely a slideable scale in the sense of uh, riding within your limits or just slightly beyond. And then again, as you grow, those challenges fade away and you create new challenges for yourself, whether or not it's the first time you've ridden at night or the first time you've ridden completely through a night at an event there's a lot of bike pack racers that you know they're not out there to they're not out there to try and you know be the best on the podium um but they still want to do their own best i mean like i'm never going to win a race but i want to challenge myself and for me um challenging myself is is riding 24 to you know 30 hours and then i sleep for four or five and i just rinse and repeat until i'm done the race um there's a lot of riders that won't ride at night this for them it feels too scary um me i love riding at like night i like i just like riding at night that's just something that i've always enjoyed a lot of my past jobs working in the bush have been running machines at night and i like that kind of focused um feeling you get where everything else disappears and the only thing that matters is what's in your light and that's it and that's partly of why I like riding at night. It's like I just zone out and I just time passes so effortlessly when I'm riding at night. I don't I don't really recognize time. It's just following that tunnel of light and not crashing. 
I really like that. I like how you, you laid that out with the sliding scale. I always say to myself, don't be complacent. And I think that kind of falls into that. Just like, you know, push, push your boundaries, you know, try new things. Don't, don't fall into the same routine again and again. Yeah. Um, but also yeah, don't so be foolish we, either. Right. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. yeah you're like, smart with that. Yeah. And you have to understand and mitigate those risks. And if you're not comfortable with the risk and the way you mitigate them, then scale them back a little bit. But in some way, means or form, you will always, it's only in nature that you'll want to challenge yourself to improve, right? The same thing as skiing, right? You'll always try that harder run um, or that more difficult terrain because you want to improve. It's no different than cycling. Mm -hmm. Define improve. Is it is it riding harder trails or is it just riding longer? That's still a way of improving. So it's just a matter of what you want to do with your riding. Yeah, I very much like that. And uh, you've kind of you kind of summarize all of this mentality, you know, this this collective, this mentality, this wanting to teach into an event that you organized. I don't even think you call it an event. You you call it a, a route you made. Uh, can you kind of kind of tell us about that? I think your, your trailer on your video is like the person perfect summary of this thing. Uh, it comes in real hot and heavy, kind of trying to scare you out of it, and then it just like, you know, DJ backspin uh no this yeah. isn't that kind of event um but go ahead and summarize it i think it's very cool i mean uh i know whether or not whether or not your followers know bike pack racing essentially is a designated route that you need to follow from start to finish and there are very simple rules it's all gentlemanly you know honor system rules that you need to be self-sufficient you can't rely on anybody else other than commercially available places and it's a race between you and the clock, and that's it. There is something that's called an FKT, which is the fastest known time, which is basically a course record. And then every year you would have, you know, your top three podiums, or you'd have some uh, placings of how you finish a race. But all of these uh, are just bragging rights. It doesn't cost you anything to get into the races and um it's just you're doing it for bragging rights or you're just doing it for again challenging yourself those rules uh again you can't draft off of anybody you can't share gear um and the people at the the sharp end of the the rope you know the 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 elite of the elite they are the ones that are racing these at at a high caliber of, of degree very sleep deprived they're not in it to go you know uh, take the scenic route in the sense they're head down and they're riding hard um well they do see a lot of amazing countryside it's not like they're touring it's not like they're enjoying and stopping and smelling the roses and that's kind of part of why i created the race that i that i did and i'll call it a race for now because it is a timed event if you want to have an official finish but i also wanted to make a race that did two things it it you know you were forced to stop and look at things and um in doing so obviously your time is going to take a hit because i'm asking you to stop and take pictures to prove that you're at certain places and obviously that's going to slow you down and that's exactly what i wanted but uh, I also wanted to find another way of creating an incentive for people to mitigate the time loss. So I added bonus photos for you to go and do, and you would be able to gain time back. And I was very, uh, you know, great. You know, I I give you a lot more time than really what it would take to do that task. But again, it was another another little uh incentive for you to go and stop and do something else and i'll i'll use one location as an example there's there's a bay that's remote that you need to get to and it's a it's a an uh, an out and in kind of uh route there is no loop to it so you get to the end of this logging road and you need to take a selfie of you with the trailhead sign well that's mandatory you can turn around and go back and and keep racing but if you take the the time to get down to the beach and it's a it's a gorgeous bay 
that if you set up your tent and take a picture of you camping on the beach, then I'll give you six hours. And I did that because I want people to actually camp there. Now you could play the numbers and you could quickly set up your tent and take a picture and then take it down and run away. I mean, that's still within the rules. I mean, I didn't say that you had to stay there. I just kind of said you had to do this. Um, but then, you know, that's one of the bonuses. But I even at that location, I gave you another bonus that if you take a picture proving that you're swimming in the ocean, I'll give you another two hours. So, and I've done that in numerous spots where I've I've given you a mandatory picture, but then also a bonus picture. Like there's a set of falls that if, you know, you have to take a picture at the falls to prove you went down there. But if you go swimming in the pool, it's at the bottom of the falls, then you get some extra time. And uh, and all of these I've done that are, you know, they're not risky to do them. It's enjoyable, like swimming in Grants Bay, um, which is that location at the north end of the island. It's known as the tropical bay of the island because it's shallow and it's very warm in the summer. So I'm not saying here, dive off these rocks and, you know, play in the surf and, and it's dangerous. I've picked these areas because they're very enjoyable and they're very attainable for, for anyone to get out and do these little bonus things. So again, it's meant to be fun. Um, I've also made the rules a little bit more slack when it comes to riding with somebody. And I've done this for two reasons. One is because I want to make it fun. So if, hey, if you ride with a friend and you happen to share a tent or share some cooking gear, so be it. I don't care. Um, that's part of how I've designed the rules of, of my little race. So, uh, But I've also done that because I know that people have a fear of riding in the wilderness. Vancouver Island does have a lot of wildlife that you can see. And I think that that's a safety net for some people is to ride with a friend or in a group. The only requirement is if you do that, then your mandatory pictures have to be everybody in the one picture. So if you're riding with three friends, right, then you've got four in your group, then your mandatory pictures has to be a selfie with four people in it. <laughs> I really like that. I, I think that's so cool because as, as an outdoorsman, as well just seeing these beautiful things is i mean that's half the fun that's like all the fun honestly if there's like a challenge along with it that's even better um yeah I just, in the the event is called uh caves and coves right yeah um so it took about three years four years or so of of me riding around and finding some new ways of riding around on the north end of the island i had already a lot of knowledge of of the island uh previously so I knew pretty much a lot of these places. Um, the problem with the island and the logging road access is there's not a lot of stuff that makes loops. So there's a lot of valleys where you just go straight up the valley and you dead ends and you're back out. So I needed to be quite creative on how to make it a, a looping type of um, route. So that took a while to kind of figure things out. And I also didn't want to make it brutally hard. I mean, there's so many other things that I could have done with it that would have made it really hard. It's already hard enough at 1,350 kilometers long and like 20,000 meters of elevation. The island is just notorious for sharp little punchy hills. So it takes its toll on you. Um, coming around a corner and seeing like 17% grade straight up, it may not last for very long, but more than likely you're going to be pushing it. But um and and I wanted to uh, I wanted to showcase some of the cool places on the north end of the island. Um, so hence why it's we have a lot of uh, really cool caves on the island. It's a uh, karst topography all in, in the entire island. So there's many caves to explore. There's not a lot that can be done safely. Um, so you're, I'm touching on the ones that are pretty cool to see that are safe to get to that won't put you in any risk. So it's, uh, it's nice that way, but a lot of these ones are still remote that you need to get into. And there's some of these that I've been to on the weekend where I'm the only one there. So it's not like it's a tourist trap where you come up and there's 50 people there. So that, and the same thing with the coves, there's a lot of, um, really cool coves to see on the island that are only a road out to it and back. So that was a challenge. So I had to pick just a, 
a couple of cool ones that you could kind of get to easily. And again, an overall kind of showcase of the of the island. Um, some people have asked, you know, why is it only the north end of the island? Uh, and that's actually because there's about 2 million acres of Vancouver Island that's private timberland. So access to the public is uh, regulated. The, you can only camp at certain campgrounds and you can only access those areas on the weekends when the gates are open, which doesn't make an event like this or, or a challenge like this at all, you know, doable. It's, it, it just wouldn't work. So hence why the majority of this is on the north end of the island where it's crown land. And for those if, for those people that that uh, are from the states and that crown land is basically open government land that is uh, accessible by everyone, and you can by law access it at any time you want. The only limitation is if that you were to go and camp somewhere, you can't erect a structure like a permanent structure. You can't cut trees, and you can't stay in that location for more than fourteen days. So that gives you a, a really, you know, broad area that you can go and, and explore and recreate and just wild camp. And as long as you're not destroying anything and leave any, you know, permanent structures behind, that's what Crown Land is all about. It's like BLM land in, in the United States, just accessible yep. to anybody, free camping, free whatever, like, you yep. know, clean up after yourself. Yep. Uh, Rob, I, I always leave some time at the end of my episode for people to to kind of tell stories, and you've already told a lot about your your growing up. I'm sure you have some wild stories that are just maybe very funny for you or oh. crazy at the time. I, I don't think I prompted you with this beforehand. <laughs> so, is there any that come to mind that you'd like to share or laugh about in front of us? Oh, there's you know probably the the funniest things are. The people you meet when you're on the trails, um, there's so many people that I've met that I've turned out we've actually had connections that we never knew about, that were mutual friends or mutual backgrounds and things like that. Um, funny story. So I grew up in BC and obviously had childhood friends and um, I was out on a bikepacking event and run in, ran into this this lady and that and it's funny because actually I knew her Instagram channel already, but um, I never knew what the like what the name was of the person involved in this this um, Instagram channel because it was about uh, an outdoors cat, and so uh, it was kind of a, a really fun channel that way. And I'm on an event and I bump into this person and I mean. You know, I'm 60 now, so I mean, it's uh, I, I'm talking to this person, and it turns out that she was the neighbor of mine at the cabin that we had in the summer. So we were childhood friends, but we hadn't seen each other since then. So this is kind of like that small story or the small world aspect. There's a lot of people that I've met that it's a small world. There, there are people that used to be in my life decades ago or it's people that we have mutual friends. So, I mean, I think that's kind of amusing in the cycling aspect, but, um, and it just comes to funny stories. I mean, I've had bizarre wildlife encounters. I've, um, I think, I think the other bizarre things is the first time someone yelled out salty beard while I was riding down a road, you know, and um, a funny story about, riding home from work one day and that there's a, a set of lights that when I come out of work, I, I've, if the light's green, I got to like just hammer so I can beat the light or else I'm going to sit there for a while. So I come around this corner, the light's green, I've got to make a left-hand turn. So I'm just hammering along and the light turns yellow uh, well before I kind of get there and I decide I'm going to run the yellow and, and get around. So I, I make it through the yellow but there's a couple of bicycle police officers that are on my left that were just rolling up. And one of them just yells out, hey, and I'm like, oh shit, I'm in trouble, right? And the other one goes, it's Salty Beard. <laughs> and I just <laughs> laugh because it's it's not something that, it's kind of very, you know, it's very surreal when somebody does that in the middle of nowhere or or in the middle of town. And I thought just like, how bizarre is that? 
when I started YouTubing and then all of a sudden someone, you know, yelled that out. And I've had that in, you know, I'm out bikepacking somewhere and, and someone will say, Hey, you're that salty beard guy. And it's, it's just kind of neat. You know, it has that own little fun element to it. And it's kind of funny, but. <laughs> there's, there's always stories of whenever you're in like a niche or a, a hobby that you like, you know, people are more apt to kind of open up and talk about things. And it seems like, seems like that's when you find those parallels when you're in like a, a community of people that are willing to talk and ignore the noise of the world, make yeah. those connections. Uh, and obviously you're doing, you're doing bike packing, which is a niche within itself. So people, if they have any YouTube presence or any, whatever they might, they might know who you are. And I don't know. Yeah. That's, that's really cool. I like that. Yeah. Um, I had a, I had a guy, I was riding to work and there was a guy that, that yelled at me and, and yelled out my name, you know, yelled out salty beard. So I whip around and we start chatting. He goes, and he's like, just, just hold on for a second. And he grabs his phone and he's like, I'm calling my wife because she won't believe this. And he, he does a video chat with his wife because, because, you know, he's vacationing from like Winnipeg and seeing his brother and decided to borrow his brother's bike and go for a little ride. And he bumps into me. Right. So I thought that was kind of bizarre, but, uh, but yeah, there's little fun things like that it's 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 a very definitely it's unusual to feel that way i mean it's not why you start a youtube channel but it's very uh, as i say surreal kind of helps keep it going too yeah and uh, and again it's it's about community it's about having fun and networking with people and that's my takeaway from it i love meeting people that just again have that same interest and that 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 energy of wanting to go have adventures and uh, and that's why i do it it's for connecting with people for all for all the the bad aspects of social media and it's uh either the you know the people and their either negative comments or just the challenges of, of working within social media and kind of being a slave to the algorithm um that's my takeaway is enjoying the network and the people that i've i would have never met any other way and clearly you're providing value because they're they're seeing you and happy about it uh so that's that's really cool i hope that i hope that this video provides value to people and um i don't know i hope you kind of enjoyed talking with me is there is there any other things you want to cover or shout outs you want to give before we do a send off um nothing i can really think of i mean uh it more so is you know just to let people know that that everything is scalable never feel that you need to have all the gear with you um, and to just scale, never let anything hold you back. And even on, um, you know, even when you fail, it's still the fact that you tried and the, the saying of, you know, showing up at the start line is the biggest, the biggest win. And, and I look at that a, a lot showing up to go on a ride is the biggest challenge you will ever face is to make that first step. So don't be afraid and don't hold back saying, I just need one more piece of gear. I just need one more thing and then I'll go do it. No, just go do it. You will make do without that piece of gear and you will have fun. And you know, misadventures are still adventures. You will just have a better story to tell. <laughs> I very much like that. I'm gonna choose yeah. that one. So uh, yeah, Rob Salty Beard, where can people find you? Uh, so you can find me on Instagram at Salty Beard Adventures, and you can find me on YouTube, the same thing, Salty Beard Adventures. You may find that uh, a lot of my older channels were Salty Beard Bikepacking, and I've done a little bit of a name change because I do go on a lot of different type adventures, and so you may see some non-cycling stuff in there, but definitely my channels are going to be very cycling-centric, but uh, you might see some some fly fishing in there you might see some cooking which will obviously be you know cycling and backcountry type of cooking you might see some paddle boarding and a little bit more um overlanding adventures to get to cycling areas or fishing areas but that's how you can find me um instagram youtube and the caves and coves also has its own instagram channel and uh the race itself is still on my own website which is also salty beard adventures you will eventually in the future have the caves and coves tough tour with its own website so just keep an eye out for that awesome this is a lot of fun i think this is a this is a topic i'm very 
passionate about. So it's kind of cool to, you know, relate it with my life and with bike packing specifically and like all the outdoor stuff you've done. So thanks so much for coming on. This is fun. Thanks for reminding me. It's been a great time. Thank you for listening to the Type 2 Fun Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a follow and feel free to reach out to say hello, give feedback, or share your Type 2 Fun story.